Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Sweet to see folks on the Zoom. And also, if you need to keep your camera off, it's that's totally cool. Um, and also extending our welcome to those of you practicing with us after um, on the YouTube channel. And I hope you feel that you're sitting in this circle with us. So um, continuing the reflections and some of the things that have stood out for me from a recent trip to Bhutan and Thailand. Um, particularly, I've been sharing some things about Bhutan because most people don't get the opportunity to go there. It's, uh, you know, realizing my privilege and class to be able to do something like this. And um, and also, it's a very protected country. It is hard to get into. They, I should look it up, but they weren't always open to visitors. It's kind of more of a new development that you can go at all. And you have to have a visa and you have to have a tour guide and you can only go for a limited amount of time and lots of things. So not a lot of people have been there, is what I'm saying. Yeah. So, uh Tonight, I want to share um, something that is, is that the right word, ubiquitous? Ubiqui well, don't say it because you can't pronounce it. Uh, prolific, I could say that, in Bhutan. It's like it's everywhere you see this image. Uh, it's called the Four Harmonious Friends. And it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's in people's homes, even the humblest homes, uh, shops, stores, in the monasteries, painted in these massive murals and hanging in mm, these uh, sacred tapestries. Um, it's in the hotels, it's in offices and administrative, mm, their, their state offices. Um, it's in wood carving, sculptures, it's just everywhere. And um, so it's very important to the Bhutanese people and is a beautiful Dharma story. Uh, so one of the things when it, when it's in people's homes, it's often given as a gift to people when they're moving into a home, maybe as a tapestry, or and it's also often painted on the walls of homes um, as a reminder and as a teaching about harmony. It's it's kind of a to foster family unity. It's a reminder of our great differences amongst all of us and our interdependence. And it's a teaching about also respect and how to prevent uh, conflicts in the home and in the whole, in, in the community. Uh, I, some of the sites I read suggested it has a Theravadan Buddhist origin, which is what we are primarily offering at True North Insight, a, a Vipassana meditation. And, but it's not, I couldn't find it in the suttas. It comes from maybe what they're referencing is that what's called the Jataka Tales which are a, mm, quite a series of stories about past lives of the Buddha, different reincarnations of the Buddha, and what the who came to be the Buddha learned through those life experiences, which eventually led to uh, Siddhartha Gautama and the awakening insights that and liberation that he came to and taught. So that may be the origin, um, but it's very predominantly in Tibetan Buddhism. 
and um, through the um, Mahayana li lineage. So all, all through the Himalayan mountains, Tibet, Nepal, Bhutan, this is very prevalent. The origin of the, like the story is told about some animals in the forest in India, in a forest that was near um, Varanasi, which I think is now called Benares. But when I was there, it was Varanasi. But anyways, um, yeah. So it's an Indian tale in its origin. So yeah, that's just a little bit about where it's coming from. So in this uh, story, maybe I'll quickly show you a couple images of it. So if I can, let's see, share screen, share. Huh. I better pull it up first. I'll show you the image of it and then tell you more about it. Can't find it. Okay, there, there. Pretty small though. Okay, this this is one. Share. There. Got it. Uh, let me make it bigger. Bigger. Where's the bigger button? Show me bigger. Darn. Sorry. I should have worked this out before I got on here. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it. This one is a wood carving. And here at the bottom is an elephant. And then there's a monkey on his back and a rabbit on the monkey's back and a bird at the top. And they're beside a tree or under a tree. Maybe this one will be clearer. That's still very small. Dang rabbit. You'd think it was my first time on a computer. So this one is actually in a monastery and it's a huge painting mural on a wall of the same image. Yeah, probably not so helpful, but uh, you get the idea, um, hopefully. Okay, so, hmm, I'll, I'll share this with you like it, a story as it's often told it's made into lots of children's books and and uh this version is told by venerable ribur rinpoche there's a couple different versions that's not the one i want to tell <laughs> this version apparently i'm very scattered tonight i didn't realize i was until i started talking this version of the story is coming from the Daily Bhutan, which is like a, an online newspaper, and maybe they print it as well. And the author is um, a journalist named Chao Ping. All right. Once upon a time, as all good stories begin, in a land far, far away, this jungle near Varanasi in India, there lived four friends, a bird, a rabbit, a monkey, and an elephant. They lived together happily in agreement that there was a lack of respect in the world, especially from the young to the old. Thus, they were determined to show each other respect in the tradition of the Dharma. So these four animal friends lived near a big fruit tree and they wanted to find out who was the oldest among them. And so they did it, this by measuring their age in relationship to this tree. So that began with the elephant and the elephant shared that when he was just a little, doesn't say he, when, oh, it does. When this elephant was a little elephant, the tree was already full grown, was the same size as, as the elephant. And then the monkey remembered that the tree, when it was still, still even smaller than that, the size of the monkey. And then the rabbit says, um, the tree was just a little sapling with a few leaves when 
it first knew the tree, the bunny. And, uh, but the bird said, told the others that it had eaten the fruits near the tree and then excreted the seeds that eventually grew into the tree. So it was the oldest and knew the tree the longest. And so they could see that the bird was the oldest, followed by the rabbit and then the monkey, and that the elephant was actually the youngest among them. So from this part of the story, um, there's many meanings that are extrapolated. And some might have thought because of the size of the elephant that it's the oldest or, you know, that it's it's the biggest one and deserves the most respect or something. And so it kind of turns all of that on its head. And so they, they're they sharing that respect is not necessarily belonging to the one biggest in size or in strength. Um, because while the elephant was the, the strongest, the, the, the bird was the longest living, the one with more wisdom and more seniority. And in some stories, the each of these animals is uh, recognized as um, kind of a, an incarnation of the Buddha and three of his main followers. So the bir bird represents the Buddha. And the, the, um, the rabbit is said to be Sariputta, the monkey is Magalana, and the elephant is Ananda. So these are well well loved and respected um, monks that practiced and trained with the Buddha and realized awakening alongside the Buddha. Uh, and so mm, it's it's about uh, in the home and in monasteries, it's it's a symbol of respecting elders, um, but more not not merely because of age, but because of experience and life experience, and how they guide the community into harmony. Um, so you know, it's not that age is always the best indicator of someone worthy of respect or even of their character or wisdom um, but the story goes on to explain a bit more about um, why this bird is given the most respect um, so i'm kind of comparing like three different versions of the story Hmm. Um. These four animals and the way they're depicted riding on each other's back and supporting each other to get the fruits of the tree and to share harmoniously amongst them is this representation of, of um, interdependence. And despite the great differences in, in all these animals, they point the spectrum of different animals and how different they are, um, but how they came to work and live in harmony and cooperation and particularly generosity. So they helped each other to get the fruits of the tree and then share it amongst them. And then the bird teaches, uh, is, is being honored and given respect. And then the bird teaches the rest of the animals about how to live in harmony through what we know as our 
sila, the five precepts of lay people. And the bird is said to have taught these uh, to the rest of the animals, which then spread to the forest and the forest became harmonious. And in some versions it goes on, you know, the king hears about it and the whole country becomes peaceful and harmonious because the bird or Buddha shared the wisdom of refraining from killing, from taking life, from causing harm. And in these versions, the bird talks about um, eating the, being mindful to eat the fruit from the branches where there aren't insects. You know, if there's insects on there, don't take those ones, look for other ones and not to, so that we're not killing. And then the second precept of not taking what isn't freely given. And so with reference to this, it's like if, if this uh, fruit tree is on somebody's orchard or belongs to someone uh, else, then we, we won't take this fruit. And then uh, feeling, not taking what isn't freely, speaking harshly or falsely. So not, not lying, not intentionally being harmful with our words and speech. And so they would be kind and speak kindly to each other and not causing harm through our sexuality and sensuality. And lastly, to undertake these trainings to not cause harm from intoxicants and the heedlessness or lack of mindfulness that comes from being intoxicated. Uh, so these are the five lay precepts or Sila, like that's that's the ground of the Dharma. It's it permeates all of the Dharma and is really uh, is one of these things that in Westernized uh, mm, mindfulness um, is one of the things that's often left out. And the the Dharma originates in Asia, and the 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 Dharma is, you know, we we get kind of selective when it comes to mindfulness or westernized Dharma, where, you know, we're not chanting and we're not um, going to temple and we're not uh, practicing a lot of dana uh, or we're not uh, really rooted in sila. And so... It's really a fundamental part of the Dharma. And certainly when you're in a Buddhist country where that is the state religion or the predominant religion, even though there's other religions, um, sila is, ethics is everywhere. <laughs> it's like, uh, I think, was it last week? No, the week before. Last week I talked about road dharma and the week before the schools and it they're they're just uh, raised on ethical behavior. It's quite beautiful. Uh, in this other article by venerable venerable Riber Rinpoche, he they say the reason the four animals worked so harmoniously together. And the reason they were successful is that none of them was primarily concerned with getting enough food for themselves. Each of them was concerned with trying to help the others get what they needed. Rather than being dominated by selfish concern, they were dominated by cherishing others. Beautiful. And also the reason they were successful is that they were willing to ask for help and receive help. That's a thing. <laughs> it's come up a bit recently with a couple folks that uh, uh, 
how do I say, were um, business coached into presenting a version of themselves that was false, you know, like really pitching themselves as being something more than what was true. And, and then they realized eventually they had to tell the truth and ask for help and say, actually, it's not like that. Things are really hard. And, um, and to be willing to receive help is massive for a lot of folks, really hard. Like even when they've tragedy has struck them in whatever, to whatever degree, you know, and people uh, step up and offer to help and they're like, oh no, it's okay. Or you don't have to and all this stuff. Like, wow, is it really that hard to just say, thank you so much. That's really helpful. Um, and, you know, pay it forward when we're able to. So you might explore what your relationship is with asking and receiving help and how that can rob people, take from people the opportunity for them to give if you aren't willing to receive. Hmm. So this story is very much about interdependence, which is, a, of course, a central truth of the Dharma, of all of our interconnectedness, amidst all of our uniqueness and difference, how we are absolutely affected by each other. And um, if we feel very separate and alone, uh, you know, to be curious about this. Is there ways that we can be in community and who could we support, who can we help, which then creates this interconnectedness, which is our, which is our nature for sure. Um, hmm. Okay. So when they when they travel around, they're 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 always depicted these four. Well, maybe I shouldn't say always. Every time I saw this image and have since seen it, they're always on each other's backs in this way: the elephant, the monkey, the rabbit, and the bird or pheasant at the top. Hmm. And it's interesting to me how this is such a central image all through Bhutan. And, uh, and uh, I actually have also, someone gave me this bag a long time ago, but uh, let's see, it's a bag with the, the four friends on it. Um, beautiful silk bag with a different image on the back. And uh, yeah, so it has a lot more meaning to me now that I've been to Bhutan. Yeah, so this this is um, you might be able to find images of this if it's a meaningful image to you and print it off, or you can certainly find it in stores where people are selling imported goods and um, reflect on that. So tonight our meditation will be inspired by these four friends and our interdependence. So taking some time to adjust your posture, anything you need, I'm gonna mute and have a sip of water before we begin. Hmm. Oh, adjusting your posture, seeing if you need any other movement, touch or stretch or 
deeper breaths. So that you take your time as you arrive and gather and settle in. See if it's helpful for you to take a few sighing breaths, just letting go of any extra tension, busyness, concerns that have arrived with you. Really let your awareness rest back into the back of the body. Back and down. So that we might notice in, in that back and down that perhaps we were leaning forward or there's some contraction or tension in the front of the body and we just settle back into the spine and down to and with the earth. And as you rest back and down, you might feel some sensation, some space to invite some softness in the front of the body, softness in the face, the heart center, the belly. Roshi Joan Halifax offers this as a meditation called Strong Back, Soft Front. And sometimes we might just feel this softening to, you know, 2%, 5, 10, just some small degree of offering some space or gentle attention if there's contraction. And then taking some time to reflect on your personal values, ethics, morality, of how you do your best, endeavor to sh how you show up in the world. In what ways do you want to be an agent of care? Or you might reflect on our Buddhist lay precepts or sila, it's called. I undertake the training to refrain from taking life. I undertake the training to refrain from taking what isn't freely given. I undertake the training to refrain from false speech and harmful speech. I undertake this training to refrain from causing harm with my sensuality and sexuality. I 
And we undertake the training to refrain from harm caused by heedlessness from intoxicants. And so you may have other values that guide you and that you could also internally repeat or reflect on and feel how these ethics uh, give you this sense of strong back, this uprightness, this centeredness, this deep strength and core. And this lends itself to our capacity to have a soft and receptive and caring front, strong back, soft front. And now we'll invite in some reflection, some contemplation in tonight's meditation, some heartful recollection of those who have supported you in your interdependent, cooperative, harmonious life. So whose back have you been supported by. You might reflect on mentors, teachers, guides, animal companions, ancestors, The awareness that we might not be partaking of these fruits of this present moment and this dharma without all of our dharma ancestors and predecessors, teachers of teachers of teachers. Perhaps you've been supported by, by strangers, by spontaneous acts of generosity or support, even by unseen beings. Sometimes this can happen on retreat when we're able to allow ourselves to receive um, support or scholarship sliding scales, etc. And this is done anonymously. We don't know who's paid a benefactor rate in order for others to attend. Or <laughs> people previously offering dana, which has made it possible for the Dharma to continue. So even unseen beings can be supporting us. Maybe neighbors or community that come into awareness. And then feel how that is in the body. So not so much thinking, but is there a receptivity, a softness in the heart? 
gratitude perhaps respect for some of our teachers or elders And can we allow ourselves to really receive this generosity as it's been offered to us, this support in all of its all of its forms? Perhaps times when we've received care or food or other forms of support drives, calls, conversations. And perhaps you can feel this sense of really being supported. And then likewise, we can then turn towards those that we have been able to offer support or may have the future opportunities to offer generosity, interdependence, care, respect. This isn't selfish for you to take time to reflect on the ways you have taken care of others, animal companions, the earth, other humans. And see, feel how in the body, in the present moment, this brightens the heart and creates this sense of inter interdependence. We can allow this reflection, contemplation, and felt experience in the heart, body, mind right now to be felt as a metta bhavana, the cultivation of loving kindness, friendliness, benevolence, interdependence. Sometimes in that practice we use phrases. And tonight we could just rest in this felt experience. That connects us into past and future and those who have supported us and those we have supported actually a very vast, vast web as those we have supported have been able to support others. And as we have received, we have been able to continue. Really, really vast interconnected web of care. If you can feel that as a felt experience all through your body and beyond, like a vast web.
And in the, the Metta Sutta, which is uh, well loved and recited teaching, it is written this way. May all beings be well and safe. May their hearts rejoice. Whatever beings there are, weak or strong, tall or short, big, medium-sized or small, subtle or gross, those visible or invisible, residing near or far, those that have come to be or have yet to come without exceptions may all beings be joyful and we could add may all beings be cared for supported respected In these next few minutes of silence together as we continue, see if you can rest back and down, inviting soft front, strong back, and just rest into this felt experience of truth, of interdependence, care. And as we hear these three bells, just resting back and following the sound, 
perhaps feeling the sound as these rippling vibrations that move in all directions. And this vibration carries with it our intentions that all beings, those we know and don't know, those near and far, seen or unseen, those born or yet to be born, whether strong and big or small and weak, may all beings be safe and protected. May all beings be cared for and nourished. May all beings be well. And may all beings know true peace. So the thumbs up first bell was pretty loud. Didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Might have been startling. <laughs> hmm. <clears throat> so um, please check the link below if you're practicing with us on the YouTube channel. I'll put the link there for our upcoming New Year's retreat. And... Uh, yeah, you can check the link and it, it'll give you the rest of the information about it and um, hope it might be uh, something that works for you. We'd love to have you there. Um, yeah, so I think I might have one more Bhutan story in me for next week. We'll see. I don't know yet. Maybe. <laughs> um Thanks for practicing with us.